just going to sort of, I thought, what can I say? I was originally thought I would just try and compare the sort of attacks, the, the roles that we had, and the, the situation, because the black butt rain, which I'm about to talk about, which I imagine you all have a fairly good idea about, and if you haven't, then you've got to buy Vulcan 6 and 7 book over there, um, and, and this is all over. But I was going to quickly go through that, in fact. I, was, I thought was the best thing to do, really, is to tell the story. I'm sure some of you have heard, how many people have heard me tell it before? Not too many, because I've only got one joke. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, well, I can feel quite happy now that I, I can sort of wade into that, and it will be of interest to the majority of the audience, even though, from my mind, this is the man who you really come to listen to. So I will now just run through Operation Black Buck. Black Buck was the name given to all the attacks. There were actually seven Black Buck raids planned uh, from Ascension Island down to the Falkland Islands in 1982. And uh, only five of them actually got there. And what we'll talk about tonight is the first one, Black Buck 1. And what the whole thing is about is about the liberation of the Falkland Islands. In the uh, beginning of April 1982, Argentina, led by the military junta under General Galtieri, tried to make a big name for themselves, tried to gain popularity in uh, Argentina by, re by capturing the Falkland Islands, and which they then were going to change to the, their own name for them, the Malvinas. And uh, they were in fact were very successful because they uh, came in almost unopposed, occupied the island with about 5,000 troops, and then we ended up we liberated them and we taking the islands, but it was an incredible task. For those of you don't, who don't know where the Falkland Islands are, I should have had a pointer here somewhere. Right, right. Anyway, they're, they're right down here in southern Argentina. You can't get in, it doesn't work. Um, oh, it does work. <laughs> Thank you. What's that? That works. Oh. Don't worry. Right, great. Right. Anyway, um, just to the point, they are right down here. Anyone's geography is brilliant. And, and Britain's right up here. Argentina is there. So it's only natural that Britain has a better claim to them than Argentina. <laughs> now, the, the whole Falklands conflict is um, been in the news much more now than it was in the sort of 1990s and so on. Um, and, in fact, it's still very much in the news. Only recently I was reading something in the uh, Telegraph, I think it was, that uh, an Air Vice Marshal, a very senior RAF officer, um, was walking down the Piccadilly and he saw a beggar. So I'll, I'll gallop through it. The story, as I said, was after the invasion, uh, Britain got together a task force to recapture the island. And when they sailed on about the 5th of April, it never occurred to me for one second that I could possibly get involved, or the Vulcan could possibly get involved. We just had one role in life, low-level uh, nuclear strike carrying nuclear bombs, one enemy, the USSR, and that picture there was of me running in a Windermere at 300 feet. That was the sort of height we'd be flying if we flew in uh, to attack the target. And that's easy enough to photograph uh, and take a video of. Uh, would rather easy to shoot down as well, I can suggest. And it's all about the crew. So that was the crew, believe it or not, I can still show this from there. That's me in the middle. People don't see them. Didn't see anywhere. Anyway, me in the middle, and a crew with two navigators, co-pilot and air electronics officer. The electronics officer, which we obviously still have to fly with uh, down the back of Vulcan, um, had all the sort of party flight engineer, uh, in the sense he operates all the electrical functions, and there, of which there are many. But his main role in wartime was to hit the uh, defences. We had rearward-looking radar, periscope up at the top and bottom to see if anyone chasing behind us. And we had these electronic jabbers to jam radars to, to break a lock if somebody was fire control radar was locked onto. But the task, when we eventually got told that uh, we were, my crew and two other crews were selected to, uh, to train for this. And we never even heard of Ascension Island, hadn't a clue where uh, the Falcon Islands were. But the task was going to be for the Vulcan to fly from Ascension Island 
down to the uh, Falkland Islands, drop a bomb on the runway, and then uh, fly back again. A total of about 8,000 miles. Uh, with the range of the aircraft, nothing like that. So we actually, at the time, thought this was a completely impossible mission. The distance uh, was way beyond the range of the aircraft, and so we would have to do air-to-air -air fueling. Now the aircraft was equipped with a refueling brake, you've seen it on the aircraft now, the thing sticking out of the front of the nose, but it was never designed to actually fly with weapons on board to war and refuel in the process. Um, none of us had practiced it, we had to learn it. The bombing accuracy was lousy. The bombing accuracy of a Vulcan is very little different from a, uh, from a Lancaster. Uh, we could carry 21,000 pounds of bombs, and because the accuracy was so poor, and because it was being aimed at night, uh, on just using radar and relying on just a, picking the right little blip to aim at, um, we, we went across the runway about halfway down, dropping 21, just in the hope of getting one or two on the runway. So we didn't really expect to hit the runway. Um, we, our navigation aids were consisted of nothing more than a sextant to go long distance over the water, just as Johnny was talking about their, their flying across the North Sea that you get lost. We were about to fly over something like three and a half thousand miles of sea uh, without any fixing aids other than a sextant about the same as uh, Captain Cook had to find Australia. Uh, but to me, the most uh, sort of weakest part of the whole plan was people like this. The Argentinians were well armed, they were actually modern equipped Navy and with, sorry, uh, armed, armed forces. They bought a whole load of ships from us. They, apparently they'd even tried to buy Vulcans from us in the early on in 1982. And uh, the Foreign Office were quite, it was quite keen on selling them, some of our Vulcans. But uh, it got, luckily somebody put a stop to it. I think the only reason was because it was a nuclear bomber who weren't going to sell the bombs as well. But the, the aircraft, as I said, was very well equipped with jammers um, targeting the specific frequencies of Russian radars, but we had nothing to equip to counteract the uh, Franco-German equipment like this Ehrlichert gun, which had a very high rate of fire, big shells, and uh, we reckoned we could easily shoot us down. Uh, that, to me, was the worst reason for trying to do this. I didn't mind getting lost, I didn't mind running short of fuel, but I didn't mind that part. Anyway, we had to train. I'd say we, we, we hadn't done any conventional bombing. Uh, my crew had to learn all about the bombs and the switchery and how to select the bombs and so on. The actual profile of the attack, initially we thought it was all low level, making it very vulnerable. Uh, that turned out to be uh, that changed, so we did a pop-up attack, made it considerably safer, but it also made the bomb far more effective. It's dropped from about 10,000 feet, it makes a nice big crater, it hits the target, sorry, the runway, breaks the surface and then explodes, which is absolutely great. Whereas if you drop this one at low level, it just almost bounces off the runway. So it was more effective but also much safer. Um, the navigation side of it was cured because we managed to get a couple of Inertial navigation systems fitted off BC tents um, and they were just put in sort of overnight. Nowadays, we wanted a, a new little bit of kit for 558 and it took us six months to get clearance through Marshall Aerospace and uh, Rolls Royce to get it fitted. And then uh, the, on the electronic countermeasures, we're saying about jamming radars, we were able to get a, a Westinghouse put on the corridor for Buccaneer. So everything seemed to be you know, looking pretty good. Uh, we were very inexperienced on the air to air refueling and only the captains were trained in uh, that refueling. Uh, but luckily, right at the last minute, they thought that was a real weak link in the plan. So we, they gave us a, the poor old air to air refueling instructor who taught me how to do the air refueling, was called in to see his station commander and he said, sit down, uh, we'd like you to go and fly with Martin on the, when they go down to the South Atlantic. And he actually said, no, it's awfully sorry, so it's my 50th birthday of the weekend and Muriel's got a party planned for me. But he certainly ended up coming with us and he was a great, great help. So after about two and a half weeks training, that's all it was, most intensive flying that I'd ever done, um, suddenly there we were launched in radio silence 
and Top Secret, well, secret, Total Secrecy, and it was published in the Lincoln Echo the following morning. <laughs> and we, what we did then, we flew, in, we had to be fuel on the way down to Ascension Island. It was just about as far to Ascension Island in the ports from Ascension on down to uh, the Falklands. But so we went off with uh, two or three uh, tankers. Uh, in fact, uh, two aircraft flew down. We actually had a third aircraft with us in case one of them turned back. And two of us flew down armed with bombs, uh, full of bombs. That is the first time we'd uh, actually done this. And we went with the tankers, each refueled once. And then the tankers came over and we carried on down to Ascension Island. Uh, once again, it was all in the news. And, uh, but this was not considered to be secret. They were telling the Argentinians that basically we were putting everything we had down there. Uh, you know, submarines, you won't be able to see it from the back, but here, it doesn't work. From, from there to there on the island is a runway, and it's just a little turning point there, a great big parking area. And, and because of that, this is this what made the island so valuable. We had a, an oil tanker parked uh, just off the coast, which the Americans had managed to lend us full of fuel, and that was our fuel depot. A funny place, nothing really there, no permanent buildings, and uh, we ended up just briefing in a, just a, t a tent like that. And in fact, the tent that we in for the briefing, I'll just to let you know, you recognize, one of you recognize the mash bit, but the two Victor squadrons were 55 and 57 squadrons, hence the numbers. But the briefing was given in a briefing tent. It consisted of there were 11 Victor crews, each with five man crew, uh, two crews now it's a six-man crew, there was an in-rod crew and all the planners and the organizers, the intelligence briefers, everything. So a huge great load of men in, the, in this tent. It was a top secret briefing given over a megaphone. <laughs> but in fact there was nobody outside for this at the time. And uh, the first thing that came up the briefing officer said what made to give him the briefing, he said, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is the refueling plan. Any questions? <laughs> now, for those of you who are in a position to see it, it, it actually shows the two little triangles on the top represent the Vulcan, the crosses represent the Victors. Formation of 13 aircraft, and all the way down, you'll see how the um, Victor refuels Victor, and Victor refuels Vulcan, until right down at the bottom, you end up with just one Victor and one Vulcan. Gives us the final amount of fuel to go on to do it. I won't try and explain it in any more detail, but I could do later if anyone wants to know. And so, we finally got the message on the morning of the 30th of April that we were going to attack the thing. The Argentinians still haven't changed their mind. We were going to actually launch an offensive to liberate the islands. And um, all these aircraft at night, after this briefing, we got out, went out to our aircraft and uh, clambered aboard. No radio calls. One after the other, we started engines and all taxied out in order at the end of the runway and took off at one minute intervals. Uh, we took off, it's an incredible sight, I'm sure, at, I say at night, 13 aircraft making the same sort of noise as the Vulcan taking off, except the takeoff run was about twice as long as what you see here in the runway when we, we take off at the weights we We were heavier than it ever flown before, heavier than it had ever been tested at, um, and off we went, launched into the air. Um, lots of stories I could tell, but I'm not going to tell you for tonight, um, but airborne just for a few minutes, uh, three, four minutes when suddenly the primary aircraft, I hadn't told you, I was just the reserve aircraft, the, the primary aircraft um, pulled that they were unserviceable and they were turning back to Ascension Island. Now, the reason for that was the little window, the DV window, the little triangular window, which you can see down there when you haven't noticed it, have a look later. Uh, it's the only little window that opens and it was so hot there, we were all stuffy dressed in so many layers of clothing and a big rubber immersion suit with a net seal like this. Um, and uh, it, he would have had that window wide open just to get a little bit of breeze on his face. And at the last minute, he, he didn't seem to manage to close it properly so the aircraft wouldn't pressurize and uh, he had to turn back. So as a crew, we thought we were getting airborne just to follow him to that first refueling point about two hours down the line and then we'd be back in the bar in about four, four hours and two minutes. Um, and uh, 
suddenly we were on for the, for the whole thing. I was reported to have said something like, uh, well, it sounds as though we've got a job of work to do, boys. Uh, didn't hear anything else over the intercom. Maybe the navigators were cursing and swearing or saying something to one another, I don't know. But about uh, 10 minutes later, uh, a little voice beeped up from the back. Have I missed something? And it was the co-pilot, because we were flying with the uh, Edward O'Toole instructor in the right-hand seat. The co-pilot was just down the back. He was going to spend the first seven hours or something uh, down the back, and then he was going to get in the seat when we finished doing the refueling uh, to uh, do the attack. He, uh, he'd just been getting himself comfortable. He brought a sleeping bag with him, and he was getting cushions, and he was making himself comfortable for the night, and he hadn't got his, his intercom on, his helmet on. So, um, this is what it was. So we just told him, and again, I don't think he said it, he just probably just went back to sleep. Anyway, we progressed down the line, a lot went on, uh, flying with the autopilot most of the time, we had to control the throttles, refuel after refuel. Unbeknown to us, we were using far more fuel than was planned. The tankers ended up returning back to Ascension Island, very, very short of fuel. And, uh, but we, we carried on down, and then as we got down, off the coast of Argentina, somewhere, I suggest, somewhere about here. Um, it was the last refueling bracket for the tankers. So the one tanker was giving the, 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 the one, the long, I can't remember the word now, the long one, longest one, he was, was filling up to full, and that one was going back. And the weather was awful. Um, the, it was very turbulent, there were thunderstorms around, lots of lightning. And we watched the, the two tankers going up and down, fighting in the weather. But when, when the, the aircraft were bobbing up and down, the, the hose itself coming out of the back of the tanker was completely out of sync with the aircraft going up. So it was impossible. Normally you just formate on the aircraft ahead and just hope to hit the, the basket. But uh, when it's going up and down, you have, you have to chase the basket itself. And the tanker pilot had obviously slightly overcooked it, broke the end of its probe off, so he could no longer take fuel. So they'd actually changed places. The, the receiver at the back became the tanker, giving the fuel. They swapped around, and the, um, the other guy somehow managed to get in. He managed to take fuel, and he took lots of fuel. But he didn't take us anywhere. We didn't know this. He didn't take anywhere near as much fuel as he should have done on paper. So, because he had to leave the guy with a broken probe with enough fuel to, to get back. And we, they were always already further south than they had planned to be. So, I mean, to us, he had far, far less fuel in his tanker than we could, we needed. But uh, he didn't tell us until we got to our final refueling bracket, as it was called. And we expected to have full tanks of geographical position down there. And suddenly, when we hadn't even got to this point, he, his red light came on. He told us, that was it, that's all the fuel I can give you. And uh, expected us to break away. I, I argued with him because I said, You've got to get us fuel. I just couldn't understand how he wouldn't give us the fuel. But it turns out, of course, he had a really, really good reason because he had, had got nearly enough. He thought, hoped he was just giving us enough. Um, he said, Follow us north. I can see we give you a little bit more. So we followed him north. And then he said he couldn't, which rather annoyed me because I then had to turn south again. Um, but I was absolutely determined that. This is, we had to do, get this attack done. A quick s few sums um, it made me think that we weren't being, I wasn't taking huge risks. We were short of fuel, probably about, um, up, anything up to about three tons short of fuel. But there were ways in which we could save fuel by uh, not running out at low level after the attack to, so in case we got attacked by fighters. Um, and also we were planned to come back with considerably more fuel than it was sort of uh, peacetime rules. We were due to land with quite a lot of safe margin of fuel. And we were cutting that down to an unsafe margin of fuel. But uh, we went in and um, we decided to go. By this time, Pete Taylor had got back in the seat, my normal co-pilot, and we let down at night to low level, gradually staying below the radar horizon, in other words, being hidden from Argentina. Our own radar was off, so we didn't give ourselves away like that and uh, we were able to run in, letting down to low level. Nice moonlit night over the sea, quite calm, quite you know, peaceful, nothing too stressful at that point. And then we got 
we gradually went lower and lower, got down to about 300 feet, which is the height I showed you at the beginning, which is high to uh, 300 feet, pretty high, isn't it? Yes, so, uh, no need to go down to 60 feet. And uh, we, we ran in there um, <laughs> and we carried on. And we got rather alarmed because when the, the navigator radar, who was doing all the bombing, turned the radar on, nothing seemed to happen. We thought the radar had broken. And unfortunately, he'd been told to turn it off. Um, to, so he wasn't transmitting anything to give us away. He literally turned it off. He should have put it to standby so it wasn't transmitting. But he still needed the gyro stabilization to be on. And so um, he's only a navigator. Um, <laughs> But he eventually wound up and he got his picture back, uh, but he still couldn't see anything. And they'd had, they weren't quite sure, two navigators weren't really sure um, exactly where they were because they'd fitted two inertial navigation platforms, uh, which independently, they just use big laser gyros and things to tell you where you are. And they're really, they're pretty good bits of kit. But, but the two of them were, were giving distances ten, about 10 miles apart. And so they, which one's right? Or, and so you have to then just sort of draw a line between the two and divide it by two and decide that your position is in the middle of these two. And an airliner would have three, and then one's way off, we just discard that one. But with only two, that's all we could do. So they, they thought they were, they weren't confident as to where they were. And when we pulled up to a sort of 500, no, sorry, flying along when he got his radar on, he couldn't see anything ahead, and yet there were quite a lot of hills on the island and things, and they really were worried that we were, we were lost. Um, but when they then asked me to pull up just another couple of hundred feet, which seems you, you don't want to do that because you know something can see you, um, we crept up. I don't know if any of you have seen Britain's Most Daring Raid. I never liked that program because it got the impression that I just sort of put full power on and pulled up into a wing over. But um, that wasn't the case. We crept up, and he said, Oh, I've got something now and then we ducked down again. And he, they were actually within about a couple of miles of track. It was absolutely wonderful after uh, nearly three and a half thousand miles. But, uh, so we went down and then got ourselves prepared. But at some point, just before we pulled up, suddenly we, got, we found the, all the alarm bells were ringing. The uh, passive warning receivers, which tell you when the radar is looking at you or locked onto you, all went blaring off. AEO's ears. I got mine turned down because I don't like getting scared by these noises. Um, but uh, we didn't know what it was, but it turned out we'd flown over our fleet position. Our fleet, with the carriers and all the support ships, were clustered about another hundred miles east of the Falkland Islands, out of range, both of their uh, reconnaissance aircraft and anyone who might attack, choose to attack them. So we were on, going to our fleet, and as we went past, they were just practicing. They, they, every radar locked onto us and tra tracked us, and uh, gave us a bit of a scare. But then, luckily, the AU quickly gathered that's what it must be. And luckily, they knew we were coming, so they didn't do this now. They could have done it so easily. And then, a little bit further, got about 50, 40 miles away, we then uh, pulled up um, to uh, about 10,000 feet to run in. At 10,000 feet, so two miles high, feeling rather safer than would have been, but the key to this was 40 miles. That gave the navigator radar time to find his target. Had we run in low all the way, he would he, he, almost impossible for him to find his aiming point because the radar just doesn't look far at all. If, if you're polar. Ten, uh, two miles up in the air, he could see the, the island quite clearly and uh, could start aiming as we ran in and we were coming in uh, from on this line here we're, we're tacking the runway down here on headland coming in from here and we got a lock on from this fellow that i was scared of with his early gun his radar locked on to our aircraft and we were just about within the, the range of the of that gun when uh, the AEO again pressed the button on his little jamming pod that we carried and uh, it was the first time that little that pod, American made pod, had ever uh, been used in anger and it seemed to work. It broke the lock and we didn't get shot down and we could carry on a little bit further. But for us, we only got shot at, or we weren't even shot at. We were once like, were you shot at at all? Oh, more than once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
you didn't mention that, <laughs> but you did. <laughs> but anyway, we, we eventually got there, and the, you, that's a picture of the radar picture, and the release time, in fact, it was. And he was actually aiming on a headland, uh, probably about a mile and a half away from the runway, and uh, that's as, as good as the only thing he could actually recognise. So, there's so many errors built in there. If you're not even actually aiming at where you're going, but you just told the radar how far east, west, north, south you are from your aiming point, then obviously the risk that you're not going to be, you could easily be 100 yards out, 200 yards out, just on the aiming. And then other factors built in. But we then went over the target, dropped 21, 1,000 bombs, pound bombs, and then as soon as the last one had gone, uh, I just uh, did, this is where I learned my display maneuvers, just full power, pulled up, and sort of wing over, back to get the hell out of there. Um, and then, next point, if you want, on the left hand side there, the little uh, Vulcan, you can see that we actually were just heading, heading back towards what we called a Rio rendezvous, rendezvous with a tanker, uh, just off Rio. And that time I uh, decided, I was, I was so delighted I was still alive, that I just uh, got out of my seat, put the air to fueling structure in my seat, went down the back and I slept like a baby for about three hours. Nobody can understand how I did that, but I can assure you, uh, it was no problem. And then I was woken up by the navigator to say it was about time I had to get up front uh, to, for the air to fueling. And I looked down and the fuel tanks then were as low as I'd ever seen them in the air. And so we were due to meet up with the tanker coming out to meet us, uh, but we were running late, uh, and uh, he had had to come south to meet us. But it was a lovely day then, blue sky, we were able to talk to him, uh, do a, a perfect join up, and I then saw probably the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen in my life, which was a, it's like being, you know, running out of fuel on the motorway, and suddenly you see a service station. There he was, and with the, the basket hanging out of the back, just saying, come and get me. And we were able to take on fuel, and this actually picture taken from the periscope on Black Buck 2, actually, not, that wasn't me. And this is, it's what it looks like out of the A's periscope, with us plugged in, and then that's just us flying home after that. And on the way, we listened to the BBC World Service, where we heard them say, last night, a lone Vulcan, attacked the runway at Port Stanley and Falklands and now has returned safely. We found it comical from our point of view because we were still about four hours from home when we were reported as home safely. But this little uh, cartoon was uh, made done by the, the tanker uh, pilots, or tanker crews, because they'd use 11 tankers, uh, about six of them had refueled uh, twice, had landed and gone off again to bring back uh, Bob Tuxford, the one who'd uh, given us all this fuel, and they've launched several, a uh, couple of them have gone unserviceable, but it was hardly a lone Vulcan mission, and uh, we always like to remember that, that we get all the credit, but uh, those tanker guys did a hell of a lot for us, and then they carried on for months afterwards, working down there in the South Atlantic, without much, much thanks. So, there we were, that was me landing the aircraft, and after 15 and three quarter hours in the air, um, world record at the time, beaten by the Americans in Gulf War I, because they decided they didn't want to refuel anywhere else. They just flew from America, bombed Iraq, and went back again. But they did have some beds and autopilots. And much to our delight, everybody's delight, we knew that we had done what appeared to be a successful attack. But we'd often done that before, dropping practice bombs and things. You think, yeah, that must have been a good attack and then you discover it missed the target. But uh, this actually, we got a photo, it was about uh, 36 hours later, taken by what we now was a, a British Canberra was operating from Chile, but he wasn't supposed to be there. Probably, you're not supposed to know yet, but now that he was there, and he took this photograph from a PR9, which showed that we had hit the runway. And the, later that day, the Sea Harriers went in and just pounding the base, dropping 500 pounders, 1,000 pounders, strafing the base and doing a lot more damage. Ours was the only permanent damage done with that big crater. 
and the newspapers loved it. Uh, I think it was the, the, the Daily Sunday Mirror had 21 bombs scattered down the runway. Uh, little did they know. And something I then learned later was that the naval commander, the overall task force commander, Sandy Woodward, picture there on the paper, I, it explained then why our attack um, had taken place when it did, because our attack was the first attack uh, to liberate the island. When we went in in the morning of the 1st of May 1982, that was genuinely the first attack. And it's because his absolute priority was to put that runway, the one and only runway on the islands, put it out of action so the Argentinians couldn't use it for their uh, fighter bombers as a forward operating base. Uh, it, had they been able to do that, they could have gone that extra hundred miles to where I showed you the fleet were, attacked the fleet with carriers, and then landed back on Ascension, oh, not Ascension, landed back on, on that runway, maybe and refueled. Or they could possibly even have come out and refueled and gone to attack the ships. But they never did that, even though the runway was then used for Hercules and light Bucara uh, fighter bombers and uh, so on. No fast jet ever uh, landed there. And in fact, on day one, one of their aircraft that came over was hit uh, by ground fire, by his own, no sorry, yeah, one of their aircraft was hit and uh, he then tried to make an emergency landing on the airfield and the Argentinian shot him down. So, one of theirs. <laughs> anyway, so what we, we achieved a huge amount there for, I, this was the crew when we got back. The guy in the middle is the poor refueling instructor, Dick Russell. I was happy to be here last night because Channel 4 are making a film at the moment about the last days of 598. And we, he was also interviewing me a bit about Black Buck. So two of those guys were here last night and they're hanging here this morning. But uh, we, between us, for this one mission, um, we're very happy to be able to say that um, we, it did actually achieve quite a lot. The whole, everything that went on in that conflict, which lasted uh, for 12 weeks, and which was a nasty little war where lots of people died, but it, we was, it was so close whether uh, we managed to uh, make them leave the island or whether they eventually would surrender. And, but our little bit certainly helped. One nice piece in the jigsaw, we put that runway out of action for fast jets by showing that we were, had the ability and the will to go all that way from Ascension Island and, and bomb the island. We also demonstrated that we could uh, attack the Argentinian mainland. And at the time, they got all their fighter aircraft right down south. So they redeployed a lot of them, and the best ones, the Mirage 6s, they, they deployed them back up to the north to defend their own airfields and so on. And that meant that the fighter bombers that came in, the Daggers and the A4s, um, who had flown brilliantly, and we had a huge amount of respect for their pilots, and they lost a lot of pilots as well, and aircraft, um, the, uh, they didn't have any fighter cover. And so our Sea Harriers, which were the sort of interceptor aircraft really, they, they didn't lose a single uh, aircraft in air combat, and they actually shot down between 24 Argentinian aircraft. So we gave, we gave them a hand there. And then another key issue, of course, was that the effect it had on morale on both sides was unreal. Uh, the Argentinian uh, army was made up primarily of recruits, and they thought it was, they'd invaded it, but they were having quite an easy time. Right, they'd had a whole month to dig in and get themselves prepared. They were told that it would, Britain would not be coming and they certainly couldn't take, take on the, uh, you know, the, the forces who were so well dug in. And, uh, and then secondly, of course, the morale from the islanders uh, who were told the contrary, or they told that we weren't coming, uh, when they heard those 21 bombs go off at about half past four in the morning, uh, they all knew that we, we were on our way. So overall, uh, nice to be able to say that uh, like Johnny defending his, what they did in the, on the Dam Busters raid, we, we definitely feel that what we did was worthwhile. Now, people ask me how I feel about it now. All I can say is that it's, the whole war should never have happened. Um, you've got these horrible governments who sort of take these actions 
and we feel obliged to go and do the right thing, which I think was the right thing for us to go in and, and uh, kick them out. But uh, it's such a shame that we had to go to war, kill all those people, and those people had to die, and others suffer later because uh, of these nasty politicians. You can't really call them nasty politicians. Anyway, so that's all I've got for now. So uh, thank you very much.